No? <laughs> so uh, what Arun and I today are going to talk about is, uh, is, I believe you've heard a lot about you know, NFV, Network Fun Functions Virtualization. What is it? And since you saw all that written in the uh, session abstract, I know you are in the field, and you know what we are talking about, so I'm not going to bore you with uh, any of those things. But uh, we, we thought that uh, there have been a lot of conversations around how do we virtualize the network functions. And, and over the past uh, year or so, year and a half, there has been a lot of traction in the industry. I'm sure you're following it. And there's a lot of discussions. I see some familiar faces, folks that I've spoken to when uh, went to their organizations and talk about it. Um, and, and a lot of work that has been done so far has been in a lab. We are essentially doing what, what POCs are, a proof of concept that what we are trying to do is doable. But now we are getting to a stage where it's ready to graduate. We, and, and we are ready, getting ready to take these uh, virtual functions from, from the labs into some contained field trials. And there are some carriers and operators who have been a little bit bolder, who have actually come out and said that you know, by a specific date, before the end of the year, they'll have some these, these networks deployed in production, and they're going to be running to it. So we thought that uh, we're going to take uh, maybe next uh, 38 minutes to talk through uh, and share what we have been hearing so far on what does it take to get out of the POC and go into a, into a production world. And I know you guys uh, absolutely know a lot better than us. You know, we, we provide solutions to be able to do it, what it takes to productionize, operationalize uh, solutions. But uh, we, we thought we'll share what we have been hearing and uh, how some of the things are happening to be able to address it. And by the way, my name is Tariq Khan, uh, part of uh, HP's uh, Network Functions Virtualization Business Unit. And uh, within this uh, small business unit that HP has created, uh, my, my task is to, to help, help cloud guys, i.e. OpenStack folks, a lot of people are here, figure out or, or provide input to what features are required to be able to host telco applications on, on, uh, on OpenStack. And I'm joined here with my colleague, uh, Arun Thulasi. Hello. Uh, my name is Arun Thulasi. I work alongside uh, Tariq in the Network Functions Virtualization Business Unit. And my focus is on uh, how can I take what he builds as, as carry grade OpenStack is and take it to the market as a product or as a vertical solution. OK. Thanks, Arun. And, and I know we're not going to do it uh, too much more, you know. Or, or you can leave his mic off, you know. I'll just talk. <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> no, I'm OK with his, his being off. <laughs> so so I, I know it's a bold statement, but maybe, you know, some of you guys uh, get all the things that, uh, that uh, we keep on getting. So in fact, just uh, earlier this week, Quite likely, in preparation to this uh, summit, uh, Forrester came out with a report. And no one's representing Forrester over here, right? And, and we're not recording. And put... In any case, this, I, this title, I got it from their report, which is OpenStack. Forrester, they did an analysis, and they're saying that OpenStack is ready. It doesn't mean that you know, we are ready to start putting it. Everyone is ready to start putting it in production. But the point they were trying to make was, and, and uh, the, the summit attest that OpenStack has graduated now. People are not asking questions of, you know, sh is it going to play? So it is ready, but it doesn't mean that every single feature that we require to run every single workload is there. So what, what we thought was uh, not going to bore you on enterprise class deployment, what, what, what's happening over there. We're just going to focus on a narrow piece within these three categories, security, some carrier grade features, and you know, multi-data center, which is inherent to, to telcos. What is it that, that's perhaps missing, and what's some of the work going on to, to uh, make OpenStack ready for telco applications? And with that, I'm going to hand it over to, Sur to uh, Arun to talk about the first part. I can't my mic, is it OK? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, as, as Tariq mentioned earlier, again, the goal is uh, try to identify what, uh, what are some of the common use cases that our customers are telling us uh, and try to work with the community to see how we can bring that uh, into what, what could be a category at OpenStack. And, and we'll start with uh, security. 
Uh, you know, going back to the earlier point, is OpenStack ready? Yes, OpenStack is ready in a number of areas to face security, uh, face security challenges. Uh, you know, uh, enterprises need to be aware uh, of what's going on uh, in the open source. Uh, you need to consistently watch for uh, what are the new issues that are coming out, and the community does a very good job of ensuring you know, any new issues, the Venom issue, for instance, anything that comes out, it gets uh, the attention of, of the decision makers. There is a process to get the fix. Uh, there is a patching mechanism uh, that's already provided. You can, you can patch your OpenStack services in the runtime. Uh, OpenStack provides a way to log uh, any of those challenges. So there are a number of uh, areas where OpenStack is already addressing some of the security reasons. Uh, but going to uh, a carrier grade environment, what are, what are some of the primary asks from a carrier grade environment? And we have sort of put them into three large buckets. Issues that impact the host, issues that impact the network, which forms the core of uh, what Telco is, and issues that impact the virtualization layer. So if you, look at, if you look at a classic deployment, you have a host, deploys a number of VMs, and over a network, it connects to a bunch of different hosts. So in essence, that's what uh, a Telco cloud does. So what are some of the challenges that we're seeing uh, in each of these domains. Uh, on the host side, so today, uh, in a, in a non-telco world, uh, for instance, in the financial sector, uh, people use security-enhanced Linux, or some variety of a security-enhanced Linux to make sure that the host is protected. That, that allows you to harden the host, that, that, allows, uh, that allows you to deploy applications in a much more safe environment. But when it comes to OpenStack, for instance, uh, OpenStack hasn't really played well with uh, SE Linux. So how do we bring together the capabilities that OpenStack has and have it work well with uh, an enhanced security platform such as SE Linux? So that's something uh, customers are asking us. The second is the ability to have uh, a full-fledged role-based access control mechanism. So Keystone is doing a lot of good work around you know, hierarchical tenants, the ability to have uh, unique admins for each tenants and so on, coming up in Keystone V3 and beyond. But uh, in, in, in an environment where, where the telcos have already deployed a data store, already deployed a security engine, already they, have, they are using some kind of a role-based access control, how can that flow into uh, an organic security system such as Keystone? I think that's a key challenge uh, that we're trying to address. Uh, Today, the OpenStack uh, configuration files, for instance, uh, are available as plain text files. Uh, and as much as they are protected for you know, users, group, and owners, some customers uh, have come out and said, how do we encrypt uh, you know, uh, my host so that whatever files I have, you know, be it configuration files or data files, how can I have a, a fully encrypted platform on which uh, my OpenStack services can run? Again, these are issues that impact uh, the environment at a host level. Moving forward, uh, you know, network, again, forms the core of uh, what a telco is. It, it requires uh, an intrusion detection system uh, so that uh, the, the environment is fenced. Uh, the amount of threats uh, that are being faced by telcos uh, these days are enormous. So the, the ability to have uh, an integrated uh, intrusion detection mechanism, that, that's been... Uh, the, a consistent ask. Uh, Denial of service, being able to protect the endpoints, for instance, uh, various products uh, that HP has, for, they use uh, HTTPS to protect the endpoints, but uh, how can we ensure any of the services that OpenStack already runs are protected? So this forms part of what uh, we are calling network security. And going forward, we have uh, the virtualization security, whatever runs in the virtualized plane, that needs to be protected as well. You have protected the host, you have protected the net, uh, network that carries the data, and then you finally protect what we call the VNF layer or the virtualized layer. Again, uh, you know, as if good or bad timing, uh, the, the Venom issue just came to the forefront where uh, every single instance uh, of KVM is potentially under threat. So how do we address uh, challenges at the virtualization layer? And, and only by addressing host level the network level and the virtualization level, uh, would we be able to provide a fully secure environment uh, for telcos to deploy? And lastly, uh, again, OpenStack 
in itself, the way it addresses challenges, uh, there are a number of benefits. And, and on the flip side, those benefits could at times uh, be challenges. Uh, a a community-driven effort, so any time there is a serious issue, either in the KVM or SSH or uh, any of the key components, the community is able to respond, respond much faster. But on the same uh, token, defects seem to be getting in much easier into OpenStack because of the way the applications are developed at, at such a rapid pace. Uh, because of the information being out there in the open all the time, there is a potential where the issue is exposed, but the fix is not, not yet ready, uh, thereby threatens the entire deployment. So that the community needs to find a way to ensure uh, defects don't get in. If defects are exposed, then the solution comes in uh, as soon as we could. Uh, you know, gone are the days where uh, open source means you know, 10 different people working in 10 different countries trying to build some small component uh, of an open source stack. Today, uh, enterprises are contributing heavily to open source. And again, that's a boon on one side, and there's a bane on the other. Uh, because of the large engineering workforces these enterprises bring in, it's much easier for us to respond uh, to any challenges or, or build new functionality. But on the same token, again, each, each larger industry vendor has a, a specific direction that they would like to take a service or a product into. And that causes issues uh, specifically around uh, the security domain. Uh, lastly, you know, the, the ability to spin out individual services so that we can have focused attention. So today, we, we're talking about TAP as a service. There have been talks about high availability as a service. Every individual requirement from a telco has the potential to be spun out into a service of its own, which is, again, a good thing because it now gets individual attention. But at the same time, there is, there is a challenge because it becomes an island of its own. So it's quite unaware of what's going on in the other, uh, you know, other domains. Is there, is, there, is there duplication of work? Is there a consistency issue based on other parallel projects? So th these are some of the, some of the challenges uh, that open source needs to address uh, so that it can build a security platform that carriers can easily adopt. Mm -hmm. That I'll pass it back to Tarek for his okay. question. Thank you. And after security, I uh, wanted to uh, just talk a little bit about carrier-grade features. Um, do people know, you know what carrier-grade means? Any show of hands? Of course. Thank you. And please, I apologize if I repeat a lot of things that are so ingrained in your minds. Um, exactly. Now, but everything, so we, we are, it, that's the fun of working in open source and standards. There are people, you know, a lot intelligent at least than I am, who have looked at the problem and they have a very thought out way of addressing it. And one of the things is under the Linux Foundation, where there are some specifications for carrier grade Linux. The latest one is version five. Not many. Linux out there, or Linux is, what's the plural for Linux? Anyone knows? Yeah. But there are very few Linux out there that, that actually meet the uh, version 5 specifications. But beyond that, we have not gone. What, what does a carrier grade KVM mean? What does a carrier grade OpenStack mean? We have not gone there yet. But when we look at it, it essentially boils down to, to you know, some differences that carrier or telco workloads have from enterprises. And, and we've got to be able to run. So in this, uh, Richard reminded me that everyone coming in has been reminding what NFV is. So I'm not going to go into that at all. But some characteristics of, of what NFV workloads look like and how they're different from, from IT workloads. In IT workload, it's about aggregation. In IT workload, it is that I'm going to take a lot of resources, pull them together, and I don't care if I want to deploy something. I want it to, to get it, but I don't care where it's going. That doesn't work in networks. In networks, you need the locality. If you have a service chain and firewall is sitting here, router is sitting here, optimization sitting somewhere else, you have a problem. It, and, and there's a flip side to it as well. Sometimes you want locality. You want different components for a network service to sit together. But sometimes you want them to be separate when you have, uh, you need to provide high availability and, and those things. You needed them to be next to each other, but different racks. Next to, in the same rack, but in different blade enclosures or servers. So those things are important. And when you deploy, so right now, if you look at the OpenStack Nova filter, some 
very interesting filters were added in the scheduler just in, uh, in the Kilo release. But in the main part, when the filter Nova scheduler looks at it, just says, you know, find me the best host to run on it, there are not many capabilities that you're able to provide. You can customize the filters to do something, and we're going to touch on it in a couple of minutes. So there are some inherent differences between network workloads. And, and the, some of the capabilities, and again, you know, loosely talking about these capabilities into carrier-grade capabilities, is that you want the detection, fault detection, and the reaction to the faults a lot faster than what, what upstream capabilities are available. And when I say upstream capabilities, these are unmodified capabilities. So if you look at it, uh, I think one minute may be generous for fault detection. Because if you look at it, OpenStack, if it's a fault in a compute, compute node or, or the host OS, yes, OpenStack eventually, Horizon will update the status of the host to be unreachable or down. But, but it is done on a polling mechanism, and that is, it, it, it's, people don't look for OpenStack Nova, Nova scheduler database to provide you the real-time status of the, of the nodes. You want it to be know about it as soon as possible so you can take, take actions on it. Same thing about VMs. Yes, OpenStack is able to detect VM as fail. Same thing if the compute node is down, the VM goes down, and then if you go to Horizon database or use API, it'll mark them as unreachable. But it takes time. And, and then performance, if you look at it, vSwitch, uh, I mean, we, we know that vSwitch, I mean, they, they running the, the uh, cloud without a, some kind of a virtual switch is basically like uh, you know, going back to the flat world of networks where everyone's sitting in the same, same network, which doesn't work. You put the virtualization layer to get the flexibility, but that comes at a cost. And when, you, when, when we are looking at network workloads, just getting one to two GBPS out of a 10 gig pipe, and by the way, this is uh, a lot of testing that has been done. Happy to uh, share those uh, test results if anyone is uh, interesting, interested in it. But you're, if you get two GBPS out of a 10 gig pipe with upstream OVS and unmodified or unoptimized KVM, it's, it's amazing. Normally, you don't go beyond that. So, but that doesn't work. You want to be able to go as close to line rate as possible. And oh, by the way, to get even get to 1.5 GBPS on a two socket, 24 core server, you may be using as high as you know, 18 to 20 cores. If you're using that much for switching, where are you going to run your VMs? So there are options available. You bypass the switch. You can use SRIOV. You can use PCI pass-through. But we want to be able to use a, a switch that's able to do this so we get benefits of line speed, but with the flexibility of a switch. Uh, I'm not going to touch all of these. You can, you can uh, read, read everything. But this is a slide I wanted to uh, kind of use to respond to what do we consider definition of carrier grade within, within the network context or telco or NFV context. So essentially in these three buckets. First one comes to availability and reliability, where you want to be able to provide the platform, which is the OpenStack control plane, as well as the data plane where VMs are running or tenant space, to be capable of going north of 5.9's availability. Now, uh, if, if you look at uh, what, what OpenStack has done with high availability, is there's a high availability best practices document out there where they pro provide guidance on how you should write. By the way, all of us, we, we have uh, contributed heavily to, to come to it. And uh, I think if you follow the, the HA guidelines, then you're able to get up to four nines. Getting five or six nines in the control plane is very hard. And, and, but that is what's needed, because unlike enterprises, in telcos, if, if you don't have, and I would like your validation to it, but what, what carriers have told us is that if you don't have visibility to the service, then you consider service to be down, which is very different from enterprise. If the visibility, which means monitoring is down, no one considers monitoring as mission critical. We consider the actual service as mission critical. If monitoring is down, we are not going to you know, raise a 
category one alarm. In telco, it's different. So it's a platform as well as the services you're running need to be highly available. And you cannot get that without self-healing and you know, this quick detection and recovery that I talked about. And, and something like you know, vi live VM migration, it helps you remediate issues once, once you find an issue. So, so these things become very important in availability and reliability. Now, performance, I touched on it earlier a little bit, that the, the as close to line rate performance we consider as part of being a carrier, providing a carrier grade platform. So you not only want to have a accelerated virtual switch, but you want to be able to make sure that, that the, if a link failure happens, the link failure is, is state, link state is sent upstream so that other components are aware, aware of this. And then you, you also want to, to in, in performance, for carriers, when, when we're making a voice phone call or watching a video, what you want is that you want predictable performance. So the virtualization, what that inherently brings it, that it, it, it tries to do a best job it can to provide the you know, same amount of, of uh, compute time, which, which if you look at the variance of what the average is and what the worst case is, within upstream KVM, it goes from, I think, the, the delta between worst and average is about 40 times, which is just not livable. What you want is that you want the average latency to come down, and you want the variance to come down so that you have predictable performance. So we, we consider that to be part of, part of carrier grade. And the third is that there's a lot of manageability that's required. In-service upgrade is a, is a norm in, in carriers and operators. You've got to be able to do the same for, for the platform, which is now provided to run all the network functions. And then you want to be able to, like Arun touched on a lot of, uh, lot of security capabilities, to solve some of the performance problems and availability problems. We've got to be able to share and not have to be able to initialize memory all the time. For folks who have uh, worked with uh, you know, kernel level stuff, we know. If you have a fast disk, if you have fast memory, the longest time that's taken is for a VM coming up is to grab the memory and say, it's mine, no one else touch it. You want that to be faster. But to make those things faster, you've got to use huge pages, you've got to use shared memory, which has some challenges on, if I have shared memory, this VM and this VM both can use it, that has security constraints. So you've got to be able to balance the security requirement, put hardening around it, and be able to provide the manageability that, that that are looking for, and all of these things together, we, we uh, at HP feel that this is uh, carrier grade, and, and we, uh, we are trying to get a common understanding that, you know, uh, as a community, we can call it uh, carrier grade. Now, with that, I know you responded to carrier grade definition 20 different, so did this fit at least one of them? Well, yeah. <laughs> 19 others to talk about. So, so to this, uh, what we started looking at is that for us to provide carrier-grade capabilities, how do we go about doing it? And, and to, do, to do it, we, it it's, I think the reason we are all here is that we have already internalized that, that the open source is, is a way to provide the innovation and collaboration that's required. So you got to be able to start with open source component, a common base across everywhere, and be able to use as many capabilities that the underlying components provide as you're able to. So you start with carrier grade Linux. There is an open specification for it. You start with carrier grade KVM. And the carrier grade version 5 specification that I talked about does talk about some carrier grade capabilities in KVM. So you start with that. Then OpenStack, obviously, being the other standard-based OpenStack components. So these start, make the basis of your, your starting to build a, a carrier-grade platform. After that, since we want to be able to produ provide predictable performance, you need to be able to provide, in the KVM especially, you need to be able to provide, provide or add real-time extensions. And real-time extensions, you know, for folks who have uh, dabbled with the uh, 
Linux and all, it's again a open source, uh, a standard-based uh, code available. You can make almost any Linux real-time. There's patches you need to add for KVM to be able to make it. And what this allows you to do is to basically create a preemptible kernel. And what that just means is that when I'm doing some work, I don't know, people, if you remember, I know 25 years ago, my kernel class, there's something called non-maskable interrupts and maskable interrupts, but IO is non-maskable. When IO wants to do CPU, stop doing it, do it. That takes a lot of time. You've got to be able to have some processes we are preemptible to say that if I'm doing this, no one come and talk to me. And you assign a few kernels to do the things that you care about. What you care about is the operating system tasks. I don't want it to go everywhere. And the virtual switching, I want to pin it because, well, this is telco. Network latency is important. So that's where you start. And then once these are added, then you're able to, you have a platform that can provide some level of, of predictable performance. And your jitter is going to be a lot less. Then to move to next level, you, you need to be able to provide some kind of an accelerated vSwitch. Now, I mean, if you look at uh, this discussion where there, there's uh, almost a beta versus VHS camps, and some people say, you know, I don't want to use vSwitches because vSwitches can never reach the place when I have things like, you know, PCI pass through or SRIOV, which is becoming popular. And there's other camp that says, no, you know, it's all about abstraction. I want to have abstraction. So I think there's a place for both of them. If you have a 100 gig switch, 100 gig NICs, which are you know, not, not too far away, and you want to do switching or packet passing, no processing, just packet comes one place to goes to the other place. No matter how efficient a switch you're going to bring, 100 gig, 200 gigs are going to throttle today is pretty much every technology. It doesn't matter how fast they you know, uh, accelerated switch you can bring in. But if you're talking about what most of us are going to end up using, which is, you know, 10 gigs, which is norm today, you can, you can use Intel's DBDK, pole mode drivers, and some capabilities to get very close to, to a line rate with, uh, with reasonable amount of CPU overhead, which is to say, you know, two cores, three cores, something like that. And our test, we were able to see uh, 20 gigs uh, throughput using two cores only. So about, if you assign one core, pin it for system task, two cores for virtual switching, you still have 23 cores left to do, no, my math was very bad. 21, 21 cores left for, uh, for doing all the other tasks. So still, you know, a lot of th stuff you're able to do. Now once, once we have done the plumbing, so this is all the work that, has, that was done in the host operating system then you have the capabilities of start leveraging this, this, uh, this plumbing to be able to deploy your, your VMs or, or, or non-VMs that can take advantages of it. But you do need to, depending on how much you are ready to touch your, your VM or you know, the, the different VNF vendors or virtual, virtual network functions in, uh, vendors that are providing these applications, depending on how much you want to touch, your gain is going to be different. And right now, I think broadly, there are four different performance levels. First performance level starts with, I don't want to touch my VM at all. By the way, my VM that I was running, it's not even Linux. So if, even if I wanted to change it, I can't, which is a lot of these virtual routers that we have. Uh, they're, they're running on each vendors. Cisco's are running on iOS, HP's on Comware, Juniper on Juno's. So I, even if I wanted, it's not as easy as Linux. Oh, yes. and that's true, yeah. But, but, there's, but we as, as carrier and operator, they can't go and make changes. Vendor needs to make changes. Absolutely. But even that, if you just run unmodified VMs, you'll see some performance gains. It may be, you know, uh, but, you know, I'm saying that as if 2x is, you know, <laughs> peanuts, 2x is double the speed of earlier, but you can get, you know, uh, significant, you know, from 1.5 gig GBPS, you may get to 3 GBPS, which is still very good. The next level is where you use a, a uh, some kind of a custom NIC in the kernel. And it's a kernel loadable mod module, and, you know, it's like, you know, Intel comes up with a new NIC or Mellanox or Broadcom. I know the Mellanox guys, they were talking about 
40 gig or 100 gig, uh, Nix? 100 gigs, yeah. So those, even in you know physical, you can't use the 100 gig Nix without their driver. So you need their driver to be able to use it. Similarly, this, this virtual Nix that I'm talking about, it's a new driver, which is the easiest way to make change. You're able to get, and I think our test shows that if you use a kernel loadable module for this, you may get up to 6 7%, 8% uh, benefits in speed. But the real benefits start coming in if you, when you start using DPDK user mode drivers in Guest as well. It sounds a lot, but you know, for programmers, any programmers over here, it's literally. So you have seen the DPDK? Yeah, three lines, right? DPDK, SDK, it's three lines that you need to add. You need to add a few places, but it's really three or four lines. So it's not a big deal. Now, uh, I know from tech, techie guys coming, big deal is you know different from what the business and support guys think. But where I was trying to go was that the changes are not that very big, but the advantages are huge. And if you use DPDK and you use a carrier grade Linux in a guest as well with a pole mode driver, and again, another word, pole mode, and pole mode driver, all that does is normally when a, when a packet comes in, the packet has to say, stop and tell processor, hey, I'm there, do something with me. Takes time. Pole mode driver means that driver is just pulling the P CPU. And it's saying, got it, or sorry, driver or CPU is pulling the NIC directly and say, got something for me, got something for me. As soon as it gets it, immediately picks it up and processes it. Negative of pole mode driver is that it basically uses all the processor capabilities, so it'll keep running. But the positive is that you are, if a, with a pole mode driver, carrier grade Linux, all the underlying plumbing, now you're able to go from 1.5 GPPS to close to 10 GPPS for a 10 gig pipe. In our test, we were, we were able to see, and I completely understand these tests are what's called the hero test, so doing in a lab doesn't mean it's gonna work in, the, in your environment that way, but even a hero test, if you can go close to nine point some GBPS on, on this, I think that's pretty damn good. So once you do all of these things, you're able to, to get to this. And, and by the way, this was just addressing performance and jitter. But now that you have done all of these things, you need to be able to add some, some carrier grade management and middleware capabilities. Some of these are done and will need to be done, there's no other way of doing it, to be, to be able to add some extensions to existing OpenStack services. So you, and by the way, OpenStack, there's reason why OpenStack is a pluggable architecture, because they expect different vendors, different suppliers to be able to extend the capabilities. So you use OpenStack approved way of extending the capabilities in, in providing these capabilities to you. What good, good is CPU core pinning if you can't specify this VM, I want you to pin to such and such core. But in addition to that, the things that the, the middleware needs to be able to add is the thing that Open does, OpenStack so far doesn't do anything about. And one of them is high availability. So what you gotta be able to do is, and you know, for folks who have used like high availability frameworks, Pacemaker, what's that? I think Pacemaker, the minimum poll, polling that you can set is like 30 seconds. And if you look at Keep Alive, do it some other way. So if you use the traditional way of doing it, you can never get sub-second detection and recovery. So you gotta be able to do something outside of it. So, so you need to provide a framework that control plane can use, and then make that framework available to your VNFs as well. So your VNF, if you want the VNF to react to, you'll have to, you can use the SDK to go into the framework and make decisions based on that. Now, again, this requires changes to your applications, but the platform provides a way of to being able to do it. And then the last one, of course, is that you don't want to be just able to use you know, a specific flavor of Linux or, or something, so you're able to do it with pretty much any upstream um, Linux that's coming out there. I think the requirement still is Linux, so didn't go to Windows or, or other things. 
Not many people are asking for it. I don't know why. So, <laughs> so with that, uh, I wanted to hand it back to my colleague uh, Arun, and we wanted to keep some time at the end so we can take some questions. So talk about the third part. Oh, boy. Now that we are at the end already. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we talked about uh, how important security is for carriers. We talked about how a carrier grid platform is important. Uh, we also want to talk about how you know, a carrier grid distributed environment can be deployed. Again, that's a key ask from, from carriers. Uh, is OpenStack ready? Yes. OpenStack is already helping enterprises uh, by you know, supporting various mechanisms for larger developments. So you could use regions. You could use host aggregates and availability zones, cells. Uh, in essence, you could continue to grow your control plane to support your ever-expanding compute base. But that isn't adequate for, for what carriers are asking, uh, carriers are asking us. Uh, you know, a, a common deployment usually involves a, a number of different data centers that run local functions with you know, one or more uh, data centers running global functions which manage your entire data center. Again, if, if, you, if you compare you know, a failure for, for an enterprise IT, thousands of people get affected. You know, if one data center goes out uh, in, in a carrier, you know, millions of people get affected. I mean, you, you, you cannot update your Facebook they're watching that next big movie that's out, you're pissed at your carrier. So it's, it's very important for them to be able to support uh, a full uh, multi-center uh, deployment. Uh, again, uh, an example of uh, you know, how multiple data centers use, a classical use case that we pick uh, is the customer edge. And, and there are various ways uh, in which you can deploy it, but each of them uh, requiring you to deploy a cloud operating system across multiple data centers, which are geographically apart, you know, completely different from how uh, traditional IT has been running. So, so what are what are customers telling us uh, when it comes to a carrier grid distributed environment? Again, uh, you know, we're following the common theme of identifying some of the top as uh, first is uh, doing service chaining. So there are no more no more VMs, no more VNF components, no more VNFs. It's the service. Uh, that matters. Uh, you, you could you could deploy VMs in you know ten different ways, but the key is to be able uh, to deploy a service end to end across these multiple uh, multiple data centers. Uh, Intent driven traffic steering. We've we've heard about this a lot. You know traditionally uh, a number of uh, number of elements that govern the traffic are set during the instantiation of the VM itself. Uh, we estimate how the VM is going to be performing and set the appropriate rules. Uh, in our controllers, but that that has to evolve where the intelligence that controls the network needs to be moved closer to the network and needs to be done runtime, not during instantiation, but during runtime. Uh, lastly, you know the complete disaggregation of components with common interfaces to access each one of them. Uh, what, what do we mean, disaggregated components? So today, uh, you, you buy a, a physical network function. Uh, it contains a number of different services embedded in a single appliance. So customers are looking at being able to break even the core networking functions that they can pick and choose that can be disaggregated at that level with sufficiently defined northbound and southbound interfaces uh, to integrate in your existing environment. So you, you as a customer have an orchestra, orchestrator of your own. You should be able to bring in a mixture of these components and have a common language uh, to talk to each one of them. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to pass it back to Tariq. Uh, no, let's just go to the next slide. Uh, there's some, something that we are asking for your support in, uh, for the operators in here. I see at least a couple. We would uh, love to hear a prioritized list from you. And for contributors, which you know a number of us are, uh, we, we would uh, love to be able to build on and, and try to move OpenStack towards, among other things that they're trying to uh, optimize, be able to provide an environment that's uh, ready for for telcos, and uh, would love for, for as many people as a few who care about this to be able to participate in the telco work group, which is a meeting is held every, every uh, Wednesday at, I believe, 2, 1400 UTC, whatever that time comes out. And I think we have like 30 seconds, maybe, uh, unless they start uh, you know, pushing us out, we have time for a question or two, if there are any. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. now, so there's an Oslo project within OpenStack, and yes, we at HP, until, until recently, we were leading that. Our PTL was HP. We, we are not now. There's other ones running it, but yes, absolutely. And OPNFV as well, which is a, an interest group for OpenStack trying to push the, the telco agenda. So both of them, yes. Any other question? Mm -hmm. That is probably because most of the vendors are taking their PSD phones or their stuff out of the appliances and virtualizing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. This is a transitional. Do you see a trend in the vendors so decomposing their, their virtual functions into microservices, architecture, mm -hmm. and all that stuff? What, what I see is uh, that vendors, there are some innovative vendors that are doing this. And some of them have gone public with their solutions, some have not some startups. So newer vendors are absolutely moving in that direction on how they can disaggregate and disrupt the market. And now my question comes in, do you see this as a fit for carrier gateway type deployment, or you still think having one monolithic big VM is better? I, I wish I could. Uh, so the, 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 there's a reality in the industry today, and the reality in the industry is that most, unless there's an operator over here who feels otherwise, the most organizations are taking their existing monolithic applications. No one's going to deploy 5G solutions or 4G solutions on a no-name, new way of doing IMS. So you're going to use some of the established. But it's open for innovation. That is why some smaller companies, software-only companies, they have come in and they're providing this. Now we'll see more disaggregation happening over time but, but in near term, quite likely, just being able to dis disaggregate at VM level is a huge thing for networks. It's, it's a new way of running the network that operators need to learn. They have to become system integrators now against being more a venture capitalist. You know, we'll give this money to this person, yeah, to come and run it for us. Other question, comment? Well, folks, thank you very much. I know we are a little bit over the time. Thanks again.